Hey, deserving listeners, new season of The Single Life, 90 Day Fiance, let's watch. She did nothing to you, so why are you acting like this? Could I speak? Be an adult. Okay. We were like a fish and a bird. Different. Get with the f program or get out. Yeah, I remember these fights, and if I remember right, my conceptualization was that they were both fairly unaware of their attachment needs and what was happening for them emotionally. I think they were both in a very typical way, for all couples, they will experience this. They were triggering each other's attachment, pain, and perhaps traumas, I don't know, but at the very least, making each other feel like they were worthless or they didn't matter or that they weren't loved or something along the, those lines. They were both triggering each other in a different way and didn't seem to know what was happening for them and they didn't even necessarily know how to articulate to the other person and so their fights just verbally, verbatim wise, just seemed so strange to me. Particularly when he would talk, he he's you know get with the program. It's like what program and and so if I was to think about each of their issues for her, I think Natalie went through some significant abandonment traumas when she was growing up. I know I often will say that, and maybe it's a, a bias that I have or something. But I'm reminded of that time when he went to Ukraine and they were sitting around the breakfast table, the two of them with her mom, and they brought up the topic of having kids. I think it was the the first full day he was in Ukraine, she starts, she brings up the topic of kids and he's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't remember what his stance was. I think he was saying, for sure, I want kids. And then Natalie was like, well, how about we start getting pregnant now? I think that's what she was saying. And he was like, well, maybe we could talk about it another time. And I think part of it was he, he was a reluctant reality TV cast member in, in my estimation. I, there was a fair amount of him that just seemed, his presentation seemed like he didn't really want to be on the show or he, he, he was okay with being on the show, but he didn't want to reveal his inner life, which is in line with his issues, which I, I think, at least based on what was presented on the show, he seemed fairly avoidant of his emotions and of conflict, and then he would explode. Even though on the inside, I think he was really desperate for closeness and had a lot of feelings. But anyway, so for her, she brings up kids. He, he's like, on one hand, I don't want to talk about this in front of the cameras. And on the other hand, I don't want to have kids right now. I mean, for sure, once we get going and get, get married, this sort of thing. And Natalie took that as some extreme rejection and betrayal from him, even though they were both wanting to be in a relationship together. Uh, they were both heading towards marriage. They were both wanting to have kids, but because he put the brakes on in a very polite way from my memory of just like, well, not now, not today. Let's not get pregnant today. Let's wait a little bit of time. She th interpreted that as an indication that he wasn't very dedicated to the relationship. And people with abandonment traumas, with betrayal schemas will often be triggered in this way. They're looking for evidence of abandonment. They assume it's there. Any indication that hints at that, it, it becomes absolutely their, their worst case scenario. It's sort of like if you're terrified of flying and you hit some turbulence or there's a bump or you hear a weird noise. If you're convinced and terrified, so it's both being terrified and convinced that the plane is going to go down in flames, any noise, oh, the plane's going down. It's the same with abandonment and betrayal traumas is because early in life, that was the rule, abandonment and betrayal. And so any indication, even how, however tiny, and I, I don't think I've ever used that analogy. I think that's pretty apt because hearing a random noise on an airplane, the chance that that is an indication that the plane is going to go down in flames and everyone's going to die is almost almost zero, essentially. Yet, you're convinced because of the fear, because of what's at stake. And in abandonment betrayal schemas, uh, it's a similar thing that when he says, I don't want to get pregnant today, the chance that that indicates not only that he's going to leave her, but he's he's never loved her. The chance that that's an indication of that is basically zero. And it certainly didn't seem like an indication of that. And she decompensated quickly. The mom and him were trying to console her. She goes upstairs into the bedroom and she's sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and crying and crying, completely un inconsolable in a fetal position over what, right? So, and there were other instances of that 
And I think in other moments, she was able to not completely go off the cliff. And I guess looking back, it's possible that there was a lot of adjustment in those first few weeks of their relationship or that, that first day when he came to Ukraine. You know, like when you haven't seen your partner in a long time, you've you've had a vacation from each other or you've had some long distance and, and then you have a chance to actually see each other in person for the first time for in a while. There's a a pattern that some people will exhibit where they'll kind of regress to some extent because of the ch the change and the transition. It takes a while to get you. You'll see this with kids sometimes, kids that have difficulty with transition when it, in a divorce, when they go back and forth between homes, the first few hours that you'll get the kid back, the kid will regress a little bit and it'll take them some time to kind of get their bearings and ha have their normal resources and functional defenses and that kind of thing. So I think it was part of that. But later on in their relationship, I think Natalie, she would have moments like that where she would get triggered seeing things that aren't necessarily there and would sort of decompensate, but but she had different ways of sort of reacting to it. I think she would criticize him in one way of dealing with it. She would uh, wander off she would start to accuse him of things. She would just start saying, you know, who knows if it's a language barrier, but she would start saying things that didn't make a lot of sense. She seemed very sure of herself, right? So uh, I think that's one way of characterizing it. And then of course there were times when she had a lot of reasons to feel abandoned, betrayed by him, because he did at least emotionally and you know, abandon and betray her quite often, honestly. But that was later on when they were starting to have troubles. For him, I think he, he has a, a similar issue regarding uh, insecurity regarding attachments and the way he deals with it is to avoid, is to push away, to shut down to just act like nothing's happening and he's more stable but also has a really hard time with what's going on inside of him emotionally and then when push came to shove he would explode like this and seemingly indicate that there's some issues going on there so yeah <laughs> that's my <laughs> and the whole time you know i kept saying it, their issues, especially in the beginning, were not severe. They were so e obvious to me and so easily fixed. You know, if if they had come into me, not me, but a therapist that knew what they were doing, like that one therapist they had one session with, and then he refused, I think, to go back. If they had come into a therapist within the first year or two, the kinds of issues they were facing were extremely easy. Yeah, that's my conceptualization of that. What do you think? You want to add to any of that? This. Could I speak? Being an adult. Okay. We were like a fish and a bird. Different. Get with the f program or get out. We couldn't agree on anything and he didn't support my dreams. So I left. And then when people on the show say things like that, uh, and who knows what Natalie fully thinks about her past relationships, but when I hear those narratives, it disheartens me and worries me because, and this is, I guess, something we can all think about. When we go through a breakup, it, it depends, right? There's a lot of different relationships, types of relationships, situations, reasons for breakups, but often, if not the vast majority of the time, we played a role in why the relationship broke up or ended or had a lot of conflict or something. You know, again, there's a lot of reasons. It's case by case basis, but, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to learn. And once the dust settles and we can be more differentiated and really reflect and take responsibility, we can think, okay, what, what did I do to contribute? It can be hard to detect though sometimes, especially without any sort of guidance or therapy, because you're kind of like, well, I, it feels as though I didn't do anything wrong, but it's, you know, the reasons for that are complex and varied, but one of them is that we don't have the benefit of being outside of ourselves experiencing us. When we are communicating, we feel like we're being normal or we're reasonable, but if you were even just to videotape yourself during a conflict, you would probably see, oh, what am I doing there? I have tone or I'm raising my voice or I'm talking over that person. Like that's, that's not what I remember. It certainly didn't feel that way at the time. So, and that's just one of thousands of reasons as to why it's hard to have self-awareness around it, our defenses, this kind of thing. But it's a 
it's an opportunity. And when we take that opportunity, we actually can grow a lot. A, a really wonderful time to go to therapy is after a breakup, not only for the grief uh, processing aspects and support and validation uh, for the way you felt mistreated by your partner potentially, but also to learn and to ex you know, grow and to figure out how you contributed, that kind of thing. So uh, because when you do that, then the chances of things going better for you in the future are increased. And when people have this narrative of just like, he never supported my dream, so I left. It's like, that's the narrative you have. Now, again, it's in an interview, it's on television, who knows what her real narrative is. I'm sure it's way more complicated than that. But I wouldn't be surprised given her and Mike's level of self-awareness presented on the show anyway, who, who knows what their real self-awareness is, that she probably hasn't done a lot of self-investigation and is very likely to fall into the same situations in the future, but with just different partners. And that's why often when we're older, we go to therapy because, you know, when you're in your 20s and you have one or two relationships and they go badly, it's hard to draw any kind of conclusions. But by the time you're in your 30s and 40s and you've had 12 relationships and all of them have similar patterns, it, you know, different partners, but similar themes, you start thinking, wait, is this me? And then people go to therapy. So little tip, go to therapy early in life. You can avoid all that <laughs> or, or start the process of learning and growing a lot earlier than that. Uh, maybe even when you're a teenager, right? Anyway, so she's saying that. I'm also rem reminded of that moment when she threw the ring back, right? That I, I can't remember exactly what they were fighting about, but it seemed extreme. It seemed very overreactive from her. And I think she was hoping that he would, you know, have the ring uh, be thrown at him. And, and then she was hoping that he would say, oh, I'm sorry for hurting your feelings. And then it would start the process because she didn't really want to not marry him. She was trying to express her feelings in a dysfunctional way. And I think she was having that overreactivity and seeing abandonment and betrayal where, or at least exaggerating it. But for him, since he has attachment insecurities around, and, and that's just going to hurt anyone's feelings. I think he, that's when that moment, I think he turned a corner and he, he was like, okay, walls go up. Because before that point that she threw the ring back, he was, you know, relative to him, much more open and positive and spontaneous. But after that point, it was like the walls went up and it, it's like he never really recovered from that because he, she didn't apologize enough or he has a lot of injuries around that sort of thing. So he became very wary. It might've been kind of a rare thing for him to open up to Natalie to begin with, which I think might be a theme with some of the people on the show that will date people from another country because they try dating in their own circle, in their own city, and they find that the closeness and the worry about being abandoned and dumped is so great that uh, bad things happen. And so they end up having this fantasy of like, well, maybe if I date someone from another country, everything will go better based on stereotypes of other sorts of people, you know, like Asians are nicer and Ukrainians are more subservient or something like this, you know, just ridiculous kinds of stereotypes. And, you know, think of George and Fisa, that kind of thing. And then the relationship is spread out so much further in time, right? Because you Tinder someone, you meet them that night, you find, you find out you don't like them, it's over. But with these sorts of dating situations, you could have months where the first phase where you're just sort of chatting on Tinder, could that whole phase could last where, and you never really get to know if the person is actually what you have in your head. And then you actually meet up and it's a vacation thing. And so there's a lot of protective factors from conflict because you're having a good time, you're on vacation. It's, you're very appreciative to see the other person and you know that phase could go on for a long time too. So it really elongates the evaluation phase of a partner, which is why whenever I'm watching this show, I'm just like, why are you not dating people in your own town? There are so many people probably within your area and it would really speed things up. Not to say that people can't find love abroad, but it just makes it so much harder. You know, cause think of like Bilal and Shida, like they met 
and then they had seven days together in person and then two years apart and then they come back and then a couple months after that point they get married and you just wonder and Bilal's like I don't really trust her and I'm like well no duh like you barely know this person you've had almost no in-person interactions and then that cascades anyway I'm rambling but let's watch I like it <laughs> But I had concerns with Josh working with beautiful woman all the time. I am attracted to you, but any girl would be attracted to you. And I hate uh, to compete for heart of my man. I'm a very jealous person. I don't know why. I, I'm sorry. I'm very, like, you know, love needy. Okay, so that's in line, I think, with what my hypothesis is about her. I can't know her personality or her attachment reactivity patterns, but this statement is in line with that. And it is in line also with what we've observed that at times she can have self-awareness to some extent. So I should take back what I was saying earlier. I, I think in the moment she lacks self-awareness, but later on, if she has enough space, I think she can have some self-awareness and she can apologize. Of the, the apologies that happened between her and Mike, I think Mike never apologized and she was pretty quick to apologize. And then at a certain point, I think she became resentful of that and stopped that. And then that's when they really went off the rails. I, you know, it's one way of characterizing it anyway. So she's saying that I'm a very jealous person and I'm very love needy. And when people say that, it's hard to know because you have to do a full assessment. When I assess personality, so, you know, some people are like thinking that I have a good bead on these individuals' personalities. When I assess personality, it takes weeks, months, years to assess someone as I'm treating them. Because I don't, when, when clients come to me, I, I don't spend months just assessment, just doing assessment. I And then I'm assessing as I go. Sometimes like as I'm providing treatment, you know, regarding what they want to talk about, what their goals are, I'm noting things that they are, you know, details that they're giving me. Every once in a while I say, okay, we got to take a, a, a side turn here and I just need a half an hour to ask you about your childhood because there's a lot there that I'm not getting through your discussions of other things anyway. Uh, so just keep that in mind when I'm assessing these individuals. I, like it, it's, it's just little bullet points that I would add to the list of like avenues to go down for weeks with people to really get an idea of what's happening. But anyway, so with preoccupied attachment, that is a result of early childhood attachment injuries. People will be very pursuing. They'll be very preoccupied with abandonment and relationship closeness. It's pretty much all they think about all, the, all day long, depending on the severity of the preoccupied attachment. They are really terrified of being abandoned. They're, they're, they're sure abandonment is around every corner, even though it's not. And they will self-sabotage by getting angry and being overreactive to people, which will push people away. And then you are being abandoned, but it's partially because of what you were doing. And they will be very jealous. That's a manifestation. Jealousy is a, a, a man, total manifestation of preoccupied attachment. There, you know, anyone can be jealous, but preoccupied individuals are particularly jealous. Think about Ariella and Binium. You know, Ariella was a pretty, you could call her a pretty jealous person. And think about Jasmine and Gino. Jasmine seemed somewhat preoccupied, not terribly so. And so I think she's talking about that. And that's another phrase that people will at least be called and sometimes self-identify when they're preoccupied is that they're needy, that, you know, they're, they're, they're overly needy and they, they're very focused on love. And the way that I frame it is that everyone needs love for the most part. I mean, there's a very small percentage of people that seemingly don't actually care about relationships and attachments. Schizoid people sometimes are in that category, but they're extremely rare. Everyone else needs love and attachment, even psychopaths, even though the internet doesn't think that, but they do. <laughs> because we were, we evolved that mechanism. So there are certain psychological mechanisms that seemingly were so important to our survival and to the propagation of our DNA that almost everyone, if not every human being possesses, like the urge to drink water when we're thirsty, right? That's a, an emotional or a, a behavioral urge that we have. Uh, now, maybe there's some extremely rare individuals who just don't have any uh, indication or hunger, this this kind of thing, or a need for sleep, this kind of thing. The, these are important enough for our survival that 
almost every, if not every human being has. Similar to attachment, almost every human being have a drive to attach, have a drive for attachment security, particularly when we're young, but really throughout our life. Now, before people think I'm just saying romantic attachment, I'm not. There are some people that actually seemingly are born or they develop in a way that they don't actually care about romantic attachment or sexual attachment, but we all have needs for relational attachment, you know, as a broad category of just having people that we can turn to when we need other people emotionally. And so everyone's needy, but preoccupied people are particularly, that's that's what it'll seem like for them. So she's exhibiting, I think, that self-awareness. All right, well, that is it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.